Welcome everyone. I'm really excited to have you. Um, David, excited to have you and Jennifer sponsoring. Welcome to Beyond the Comfort Zone Live. It's a show that helps you step out of your comfort zone into a place of growth and learning. Um, for those of us joining for the first time, um, I'm Aviva Walmer and I'm a Vistage Chair here in Atlanta. I lead a group of incredibly driven and ambitious CEOs who want to accelerate towards their goals faster. Our peer group is a mastermind of CEOs who come together regularly to share ideas and experiences and support one another, knowing that together they're going to achieve more than they would on their own. No matter how many years of experience a leader has, the reality is their knowledge is limited to their own experiences and they don't know what they don't know. So they haven't had a chance to be exposed to it yet, which is why a peer environment is so great because it gives opportunities to see the unknown and be more proactive and make better decisions. Today, I am honored to have David Friedman of High Performing Culture as my guest. David is a highly sought after and top ranked Vistage speaker on the topic of culture. He's written two books, one of which is on culture in a remote workplace, a hot topic these days. Um, and he's helped hundreds of companies throughout North America implement his culture-wise operating system. But I have to say, the reason I asked David to speak today isn't because of all of his awards and all of his recognition. He's got a ton of that. Um, it's because I've seen the impact that his work and company has had on businesses, including my own. Um, before becoming a Vistage chair, I was CEO of a steel service center, and I was a member of a Vistage group. When I joined my group, I was really impressed by several of the members' cultures. I was attracted to what they were doing. They had concrete ways to create a culture um, that honestly I strive to have in my own business. And so I started emulating, modeling, implementing some of the things that I saw them doing. And later I was to find out that about a year or two before I joined Vistage, there was this speaker, David Friedman, who did a workshop for my group. And a lot of the things that I was attracted to that they were doing came from David and his workshop. So that couple of hour workshop basically had these companies change the way they worked to improve their cultures and create a uh, culture that really attracted talent and retained talent. So I had to get to know this person for myself and I went and attended mm -hmm. his annual conference. So the reason that I am having David speak today isn't because of all the things I shared before, but it's because of the impact that I have seen culture wise have on so many business already to this day. And I'm looking forward to giving you guys a glimpse into some of those insights. Um, also, I want to give a shout out to Jennifer. I'm going to totally mess up your last name, but uh, Montalanico or Montalanico. I'm going to get it right eventually. Um, awesome. And her company, Insperity, for sponsoring this event and for spreading the word. Um, for anyone that wants to meet with myself one on one, David one on one, or Jennifer, um, in the chat, I have already put contact info for all of us. So you have that access to that. Um, I'm going to start by just asking David some questions, but I'd love you guys to participate as well. Um, please stay on mute and put your questions in chat and I will start to throw them out to David um, as appropriate as he's sharing his story with us. So please put your questions in chat. Um, David, before we get on to how to create an intentional culture, Sure. that attracts, retains talent. Can you tell everybody a little bit about how high-performing culture came to life? Sure, yeah, it's an interesting story, uh, Aviva. So uh, my background, I come from, the, from Philadelphia, Southern New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia. And I spent 27 years as the CEO of a, was an employee benefits consulting company. And I grew that company from two people to, a little bit over 100 people. And during the years that we were growing that company, it was a very successful company. We were seven or eight times named one of the best places to work in the Philadelphia region. We were five or six times named one of the fastest growing companies. We won leadership awards and service awards, all kinds of things. But the foundation of everything that we did, I mean, everything, all of our success was based on the culture that we had built in that company. And as the CEO of the company, I did a lot of things in a very intentional way to make that happen. Well, I eventually sold my company to a large publicly held multi-billion dollar company. And uh, I retired from that industry. 
And I was too young to be retired. I was even younger then than I am now. And I was too young to be retired, but I wasn't sure what I was going to do next. And whenever people heard me speak about the things that we were doing in our company, they'd say, you know, that's really interesting. Uh, you should write a book about that. And so I knew sooner or later I would do that. So back in 2011, I wrote my first book, which was a book called Fundamentally Different. And it was a leadership book about the things I had learned and had taught to so many other people. And I wrote that book. I'm always very honest about this, Aviva. I wrote that book as a, as a closure step, as a way of kind of wrapping up my career in a nice bow and putting it behind me so I could go on and do something totally and completely different. And well, I didn't know it wasn't going to quite work it out. It didn't work way. very well. It didn't quite work out that way. And what ended up happening actually is Vistage, what Aviva was talking about. So I had a former client of my old company in Southern New Jersey who happened to be in a Vistage group. And he called me one day after reading my book and he said, you know, that's a really interesting book. You should come speak to our Vistage group. And I, of course, said, what's a Vistage group? I didn't know it. I never heard of Vistage. And he explained to me what Vistage was, and he hooked me up with the chair, somebody like Aviva. And, um, and the chair screened me to make sure I wasn't some sort of a crackpot because Vistage chairs want to make sure they bring in good speakers. And so he screened me and, and invited me to come and speak to their group. And I was just going to do that one talk. That was it. It was my only talk. But what happens is if, if you do a good job, the word spreads. And I started getting emails from the Vistage headquarters saying, well, you go to Atlanta and Boston and Chicago. And I thought, well, I'm not doing anything else. I guess so. And so I did the next month, I actually went to Chicago and a guy came up to me after my talk and he said, you know, that was really interesting. Could I hire you to help me do what you just talked about in my company? And I thought, well, shoot, I'm retired. I mean, what I would do with the guy, but I'll figure something out. And I did. And so here I am, you know, seven, eight years later, actually, I was in, I was just saying before we started, I was in Boston yesterday where I did my 576th Vistage talk in the last eight years. So I spoke about a one, lot of Vistage huh? years. That's a lot of book, a lot of talks, 576 of them. And, uh, and, I, and since that time, I've, so I've spoken to all these Vistage groups. I have worked with more than 400 companies in all different industries. I've, I've written two other books. I've built the whole system around this, but it all comes from the experience that I had as the CEO of my company so that everything that I teach comes from my personal experience. So I'm not one of those, you know, sometimes there are consultants who might be smart, but they've never really done this. Everything I teach, I did in my company. That's where I created it. And so I, I have the privilege of being able to share it with so many people. And, you know, much as you described, so many people say it's just it's been transformational for their companies. And so for me, it's a privilege to be able to share what I've learned. Well, it's a privilege for us to get to hear some of it today. So thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> um, you know, I'd love your perspective because you are very intentional about culture, but most companies mm. are not. They don't spend so much time or thought on it. Why should a company be intentional about their culture? Yeah, that's a good question, Adina. You know, I, I think it really starts with recognizing that the culture in any organization, I don't care whether it's the companies that people on this call may be a part of or leading perhaps, or whether we're talking about a sports team or a family or a church group or a synagogue or anything else, the culture in any group of people has an enormous influence over every single thing that happens in the company or in, the, in that group. And so uh, there's an, uh, an example that I sometimes use in my talks. And I talk about, um, I, I live in this town called Moorestown, New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia. And the high school in my town has always been known for one particular sport. It's the sport of women's lacrosse. Lacrosse is very big in my area of the country, more so than other parts. And the women's lacrosse team in my town, for as many years as I can remember, I'm going back 25 or 30 years, every year they're ranked in the top like five or 10 teams in the country. And, and I always like to talk about them because I find public high school sports dynasty, dynasties to be a really interesting group of teams to study. And if you're wondering where I'm going with this story, I'm gonna tie this back to the answer to Aviva's question. So the uh, public high school sports dynasties are fascinating because they have two dynamics that make them really unusual. The first is that in a public high school, for the most part, you can't recruit. 
You're just stuck with whoever lives in your town. So think about that in the context of a company. Imagine if anybody who came to your company and knocked on your door and said, okay, I want to be hired, you had to take them. How hard would that be to build a great company? Yet that's what public schools do. Secondly, in school environments, remember too, you're, you're turning over your roster every year as kids are graduating. So think about that again in the context of our companies. Imagine if anybody who, we, who came to our door and said, I want to be hired, you had to take them and you turned over most of your company every year or two or three. How hard would that be to build a great company? Yet that's a public high school sports dynasty. And, and so if you think, well, what are they doing? How are they making that happen? What they're doing is they've created cultures. They've created levels of expectation that affect people. And so I, I sometimes will say it this way, that if you picture the people in your organization, most of them will exist on a very typical bell curve, like most things. On one end of the spectrum, if you picture your people, typically I find about five to 10% of those people are people that I like to call rock stars. These are the people, you could put these people anywhere. It doesn't matter where you put them. They're going to be fantastic because it's just who they are. And on the other end of the spectrum, you've got five or 10% of your people who will stink no matter where you put them. But in between, you got about 80% of your people who are going to go with the flow. You put those people in a high performing environment, they will look around consciously and unconsciously and they'll figure out, I guess, I guess that's what people expect here. And they'll raise their level of play to match what they see going on around them. And you take the same people, exact same people with whatever their skills or talent or ability is, put those people in a low performing environment, they're gonna to sink to the level of the people around them because the environment is that much influence. So to answer your question more directly, Aviva, what, what that suggests to me is if we understand that our culture affects everything about how people perform, is that something we're just going to leave to chance and just hope that somehow that's going to magically work out on its own? I wouldn't want to do that. I'd want to make sure that as a leader, if I had some way that I could systematically create the kind of environment that would cause my people to elevate their game, that would seem like a pretty smart thing to do. And so in your opinion, yeah. culture really yeah. drives performance and it results for organization. Drives everything. I mean, think of it this way. If, if you're a leader of a company and you think about all the different things you could work on to improve your company, I don't know that there's, I don't know that there's more than, that there's, that there's one, let's put it this way. I don't know that there's one thing you could do that would touch more parts of your company than working on your culture because it affects your ability to recruit the kind of people you want. And everybody's struggling to get people right now. We all know that we could talk more about that. Yeah. It affects your ability, your ability to retain the people you want. It affects how well people collaborate or do they work in silos. It affects whether they deliver fantastic service to the customers or not. It affects whether they're innovative. It affects how productive they're, it affects just about everything. Mm -hmm. So you think about if I'm a leader, what could be more important for me to improve my company than to be working on my culture? I mean, it's, it's that obvious. Which is why you invest a, your life in it. Yeah. And yet it's so striking that no, most people don't do it, even though it's um, that obvious. We did get a question. Uh, yeah. Someone's curious what your definition of culture is. Yeah. My definite culture, it's a great question because if we don't know what we're talking about, it's pretty hard to sink our teeth into it. So my definition of culture is it's really the set of behaviors that define how people operate in a given context. And when I say that, uh, there's sort of two parts to that definition. The first is this idea that it's a set of behaviors. So it's not all the lofty things that we say are important. It's what people actually do, the way they operate in, in a given context environment. And I say in a given context, because the same people perform differently in different places. Like picture, you know, you've got, you are different when you are with your friends from high school or college than you are with your coworkers potentially, or your softball team, or you're at church or whatever, that you, it's not, and it's not being two-faced, it's just the, the people we're with affects how we do things. So, the, the, to me, the culture is the set of behaviors that govern how people operate in a given context. Okay. So it's all about behaviors at the end of the day. 
all about behaviors, all about behaviors. Okay, getting some very good questions coming in and I will make sure to be addressing them as we keep going. Right. Um, so in an overall context, and then we can talk about remote and attracting talent, retaining and more specific, um, can you give us some insight on how you become intentional about behaviors and cultures? How do you set the stage you want? Yeah. So before I do that, I want to mention one other thing that I think is useful for people to keep in mind as it relates to your question earlier of why does this matter? And, and then, I'll, then I'll, I'll go to more directly to that question. So I, I was thinking about this the other day. I was, um, I was, I do a lot of traveling and I was in Cleveland and I was Cleveland's one of those airports. I don't know if anybody's on this call from Cleveland, but they're one of those airports like many, Atlanta being one of them, where when you get when you get out of the airport, you have to take a shuttle bus over to the rental car center. Of course, in Atlanta, you just have that the the, the non peopled version of that, the, the transit system. But so you take the shuttle bus over to the, the, the car rental place. And I got on the shuttle bus recently. And the, the driver, the guy was amazing. This guy was really enthusiastic and he was friendly and he was helpful and he's telling jokes and he's helping people with their bad. The guy was amazing. And I saw that. And it, it, what I thought about is I thought, is it just lucky that I happen to get the guy who happens to be like that? Or is that the way they do business? Mm -hmm. And the question for those of us on this call is, if you think about your company, if I, if I call your company, is it luck that sometimes I get somebody who just happens to be wonderful or is that the way you do business? In companies that, have, that focus on their culture, that's the way we do business. There's a systematic way that we operate and it doesn't matter who you call or who you deal with, you're gonna get this amazingly consistent, incredible experience because that's the culture there. In other companies, it's just luck. So one of the questions that just came in is, who sets those behaviors? So in an intentional yeah. culture, where does that come from? Yeah. So let's, let's go right there. And then we'll talk about how do you do it? So, so the who. This is a, a place where I think it's very important to understand that ultimately it is a leader's responsibility to be the one to set the, the organization's culture. Now, that doesn't mean other people can't be involved in this, but ultimately this is a leadership function. It's one of the most important functions of a leader to establish this is where we're going and this is what we're about. I had a, um, I mean, I one more piece that I'll tell you a brief story about this, but I, um, I say that it's a leader's responsibility and I say that ultimately it's the leader, but the leader should also include the senior leadership team. And, but I'm gonna be very careful in the language I use for this. So notice how I say this. We should, if I'm the CEO, I should include my senior leadership team for their contribution to my thinking. Notice how I said that, for their contribution to my thinking. In other words, I'm going to include my senior leadership team not to make them feel good. I'm going to include them because they're smart, because these are really smart people. And they got to put so. ideas. I hope so. <laughs> and their, their ideas could influence mine. But at the end of the day, this isn't a majority vote. It's not a consensus. It's not, let's make sure everybody on the team gets a little of what they'd like to see. It's what I, as the CEO, have as a vision of my company. And, but I'm influenced by the really smart people on my team. A quick little side story about this. So a, a, a month or so ago, I had the good fortune of spending some time with Horst Schulze, who was the founder and CEO of Ritz Carlton for many years. So many people may know his name and he, he lives in Atlanta. Uh, we're outside of Atlanta. Um, and, and, and I'll tell the story later, but I, I patterned so much of what I learned after things I learned from Ritz Carlton. So Ritz Carlton has been very influential for me, but I had a chance to spend several hours with Horst um, over dinner, just the two of us. And I picked his brain a little bit about how he created some of the things that they did at Ritz Carlton. And he said to me something I thought was very interesting. He said to me, in his view, the CEO of a company has two major responsibilities, the two most important responsibilities. He said, the first responsibility of a leader is to set the vision for the organization. If you're the CEO, it's your job to set, where are we going? What, what, where are we heading here? He said, the second thing 
is that it's the responsibility of the leader or the CEO in particular to set the standards for the company. You know, this is the way we do things around here. This is what's important to us. And it's his, job, his or her job to do that. And so I think this is very significantly a leadership function. And I would tell you that it's a mistake that I witness in so many companies, that in so many companies, I think one of the biggest mistakes people make about this is over collaborating about the, the, the design of the culture. They, that they'll go through an, uh, an exercise where they'll get all the employees involved. Everybody will put post-it notes on the walls and they'll wordsmith and they'll try to decide what the culture is. And I think it's a terrible mistake because I think that ultimately it is a design function. We are designing the extraordinary company we're trying to build. We're not designing around all the employees we happen to have on October 28th of 2021 and what they would like to see. We're designing around the leader's vision of the company they're trying to build. And, and as a, one last comment about this, the reason, by the way, that in my observation, many companies over collaborate about this is actually a good reason. It's just that there's a fault in the logic. The reason that they over collaborate is typically to get greater buy-in and engagement on the part of the workforce. And that's a really important goal to get buy-in and engagement. The mistake in the thinking is that the only or best way to accomplish that is by getting everybody to be an author of it. We actually get amazing involvement and engagement and buy-in by how it gets rolled out into the organization and everybody participates and they get all excited and they love it and they didn't have to author it. So the goal of engagement and buy-in is a worthy goal and an important goal it's just that they don't need to be the author of it in order to do that. So from my perspective, long-winded answer, but from my perspective, this is a leadership function. It's okay. the leader's responsibility to author the culture of the organization. So I think I'd be getting ahead of myself if I asked you how you get that buy-in engagement through rollout, since we haven't you talked about the behavior. We'll get back to that. <laughs> so let's take a step back and yes. dive into, okay, behaviors, leaders supposed to set them. How does a leader decide what they are? How, does they, how do they define this very ambiguous thing to actually set this culture for their team? Yeah, that's a great question. So when we talk about how to define the culture, I make a very important language distinction between two different ideas. And this is going to sound at first maybe picky or just semantics, but I'm going to show you why it's more than semantics. It's a really important issue. So I make a big deal about the difference between what I call or many companies call core values mm -hmm. and what I call behaviors when I use that language behaviors. So let me describe what that difference is and why is this important? So a core a value to me is typically an abstract concept. So examples of values are things like quality, integrity, loyalty, respect, teamwork, service, innovation. These are ideas, concepts. A behavior, in contrast, is an action. It's okay. something I can see people doing. So give you some examples of behaviors. Some of the behaviors I teach in my company are things like honor commitments. That's something you actually do. Practice blameless problem solving. Get clear on expectations. Do what's best for the customer. These are actions that people do. So a value is an abstract idea. A behavior is an action. In parts of speech, I sometimes think of it almost like, like a value is a noun and a behavior is a verb. It's a thing versus an action. Now, the reason this is important and not just semantics is that the problem with the way most companies craft their typical core values is that they're so broad and they're so abstract that they mean too many different things to different people and they become hard to operationalize. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a, a client the other day or, or a prospect actually, now a client the other day. And they, it was a company that was really passionate about their culture. And the, the CEO told me, we got three core values that we talk about all the time. And their three core values were love, trust, and respect. And they're very important to this guy. And, and they talk about them a lot. The problem is, what do those words mean? What does that look like in action? It means a lot of different things to different people. What you mean by respect may be very different from what I mean by respect. Mm 
So to simply say, we value love, trust, and respect, great. But how do I operationalize it like that? It means too many different things to different people. We've so got I got to ask, because I would yeah. bet that if I had people raise their hands, almost everybody in this call has values somewhere yeah. on their website or their wall. Um, are you saying we should get rid of values altogether and just move to behaviors? Mm, good question. Maybe. So here's what I would say. Um, and this is a little controversial because everybody is so tied to their core values. <laughs> but here's what I would say. If, we're start, if I were starting from scratch, so the, the answer to that question is different depending upon where our starting point is. Okay. So if I were starting a company and, okay, I got nothing. I'm trying to decide what I want my culture to be. I just go straight to the behaviors. So in my company, I do not talk about any set of core values. It doesn't mean I don't value anything. It's just, I don't know what the utility is in me articulating them. What I need to have is I need to know what I want my people to do. I need to articulate those behaviors. I give those behaviors, by the way, a name. It's just my nomenclature. I call them fundamentals because they're fundamental to success. So I, I, in my company, we practice our fundamentals and I don't talk about any particular core values. I don't need to. This is what we want our culture to be. Now, having said that, to your point, if we were to ask everybody in this call and to raise their hand, probably all of them at some point have defined a set of core values before. Mm -hmm. And so when I teach people about the concept of behaviors and the light bulb goes off and they get it, then they always worry, uh-oh, well, what do I do about that stuff we've been talking about for the last five years? <laughs> I can't possibly say, I listened to Aviva's, you know, her LinkedIn live and that Friedman guy said, we should scrap the values. We're going to bag all that. I can't do that. So now what do I do? So here's the easiest solution. This is, this is what I've done many, many times. If you're an organization and you already have a set of core values that you've been promoting, that you've been talking about, that are on your walls, what I suggest you do is just temporarily, just for a moment, put them off to the side. And I want to be clear, I'm not suggesting the values are stupid, just that they don't bring the clarity that we need. So what I suggest you do is you park them on the side just for a minute and allow yourselves the intellectual freedom to just think about without any limits at all, what are the behaviors that are important to us? And then when we message it to the organization, the way we would message it to the organization is we say, you know, those five core values we've always talked about that are on our walls and they're in our performance reviews and we've always you know, promote, promoted these. Well, those are really important here. But what do those values mean on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, this set of behaviors over here is how we live to our values. Now, I wanna be really clear here. We don't try to do any kind of a mapping exercise where we don't try to say, well, these three behaviors equal value one and these four equal value two. We just say the way you live to the core values we've always talked about is by practicing these behaviors as a set that this set of, value, of behaviors t is how we live to the set of values. And when we do that, it allows us to really start focusing on our behaviors without having to, to eliminate or abandon everything that we've always talked about. That you can present this, the behaviors, as a deepening or an extension of whatever legacy work may already exist in your company. And that's the easiest way to tie those concepts together. Okay, so there's probably people shaking their heads on this one. That makes sense. I get it. These behaviors make sense. How do I go about defining behaviors as a leader of my organization? What does that exercise look like? Yeah. So the, the exercise looks like this. The first thing you do is you get your leadership team together and you start to do a little bit of brainstorming and you ask yourself some questions. And so here are some, here's some, some good questions that are, are good to kind of start the brain going to get that brainstorming happening. I think about what are the things that you as a leader say, if we could just get our people to do these things more consistently, oh man, watch out, we'd be amazing. What are those things? What are the things that as a leader drive you crazy? Every one of us as leaders have things that when we see them going on in our companies, we just want to pull our hair out. That's what happened to me. And, um, and so we, we just, you know, they drive us crazy. Well, what's the opposite of that thing? If it drives you nuts, you got some energy about that. What's the opposite of that? If they weren't doing that thing that drives you nuts, what would they be doing instead? 
What are things that you as a leader go on rants about? Oh, there goes Aviva. She's on one of her kicks again. You know, you wouldn't rant. They wouldn't, you wouldn't be ranting about it if it wasn't important. That's why you're ranting about it. Here's, here's one of my favorite questions. Here's, this is a real good one. Think about typically in every department of our company, we usually have one or more people in each area of our company who we wish we could clone. The people you say, boy, if I could get three more guys like that guy or two more women like that woman, we would be amazing. Picture your very best people. What do they do that makes you want to clone them? Well, you should see, she always does, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's probably a pretty good list of behaviors. Sometimes, you know, it helps to, if you picture real people, it helps you to think of them instead of just trying to have this abstract exercise in your brain. The reason, by the way, that, that this is such an important thing is that, 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 that we've got to be able to visualize and explain to people what we want them to be doing. So the more clearly we could describe that, the easier it is to teach and coach and guide and give people feedback about this stuff. The whole reason that this behavioral thing is such a, an important issue is that, again, driving a culture is mostly about teaching. And if we're going to teach our people what we want and coach them, the clearer we are about that, the better. It is extraordinarily difficult. Any of you who are on this call, think about if you've ever tried to coach somebody about their values. That's really hard. You're not do showing enough love right now. What the heck is that? I don't even know what I'm doing. But I can say, I can say very clearly whether they're honoring their commitments or not. I could talk all day long about what I see them doing or not doing and give them coaching and help and support and feedback on. So it's really hard to coach people about values. It's easy to coach them about behaviors. And that's what I'm trying to get done. Now, you know, the question I think on everybody's mind who probably joined this session today, talent is a problem, right? It's so hard to find people. Um, there's this great resignation everybody's talking about. So how do these behaviors help somebody, a company attract talent or retain talent? Yeah. You know, it is a big issue. And everywhere I go, I hear people so, fr I, it's interesting. As I talk to all these Vistage groups, I'm speaking to a lot of CEOs. And what I consistently hear from people is, business is booming, we're doing, we're, we're selling more than we've ever sold. And we got two problems. One is supply chain issues, which is not our topic today, but everybody's struggling with that. And the other is, I can't find anybody to hire, let alone good people. I can't find anybody to hire. You know, we, we hired 10 people, but we need 50. And everybody's struggling with that. So it, it's really hard. So when we think about how are we going to find the people we want, and, and I think anytime we're talking about hiring, we have to talk about retention at the same time. Because obviously, I got to keep the people I have. If I lose somebody and we're in this environment where it's hard to find workers, I'm really up a creek. So I got to make sure I'm not losing people that I got right now that I want to keep. And I also got to find new people. Well, when you look at, so what are, what are the reasons? What, what are the reasons that people choose to go work somewhere or choose to leave somewhere? Almost always very high on the list of every survey you look at is the culture of the organization that when we've got the right kind of culture, we're attracting people who want to work in that kind of environment. When they've got a choice, I mean, it's, a, it's a, an employee market more than it's an employer market. They get the choice to say, where do I want to work if I want to work? And, and if they're going to choose, they're going to choose a place that they feel connected to, that they feel like you know, is a culture that they want to be a part of. And so to the extent that we've built the kind of culture that is great, it's gonna attract people to wanna to come to work for us versus competitors, and it's gonna help us to keep it. It's interesting, uh, you mentioned earlier, Aviva, that you would come to one of our annual summits that we do. So we do this annual conference that brings together companies that are really passionate about culture to share best practices and learn from each other. So we just had last week was our annual summit in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and uh, you should have been there. But um, the- <laughs> Next year. Next year, it'll be filled November 2nd to 4th for anybody that's putting it on your calendar. Um, but anyway, one of the things we did during the summit is we had a, a, a panel discussion among people who are working on their culture. We took five companies, we put them in the front of the room, and we specifically focused on this issue. 
So what are you doing to attract and retain people? And most, and more significantly, how are you using your culture to do that? And it was fascinating to hear these companies talk about it. And first of all, all of them are using their fundamentals in the recruiting process and in the interview process. So first of all, in the recruiting process, they're telling their people about their culture, they're sharing their fundamentals. And while many companies may talk about their core values, there's no substance behind it. When, these, when candidates see how serious we are about our culture and the way in which we practice it and work on it, and we haven't even talked that much about how to work on it, but when they see how, how serious and committed we are to our culture, they say, wow, that's not like everybody else that just has their core values on the website. This sounds different. It's the kind of company I'm interested in. Secondly, when we're interviewing people, we're asking interview questions around the fundamentals, around the behaviors, so that we can ascertain, is this person really the kind of person who's going to be a fit in this kind of culture? It was interesting that in that panel discussion, quite a few people gave specific stories and examples of candidates that they hired who told them that, you know what, you know what the reason was that I came to work here? Your culture. That's what's, that, that told me that's why I wanted to work here. And each of them had plenty of stories about that. So it is a tough labor market. And so we got to have some way of standing out. And by the way, if we're not featuring our, featuring our culture and our fundamentals on our websites and other places, how would candidates know that we're the kind of place they'd want to work? You know, we have to have, we got to raise the flag and say, hey, you know, let me tell you about our culture with some real substance and meat behind it, not just again, oh, we got some core values on our website, but let me really show you what our culture is and how we work on it. It needs to be prominent enough so that employee who's scanning possible employers and looking at websites and other things gets to yours is, whoa, those people are different. That sounds pretty interesting. I might want to work there. If we're not telling them about that, how would they know? So here's a scary question for you in this environment. Yeah. People need talent so bad they're trying to grab it right and left. I mean, yes. my recycling hasn't been picked up in two weeks because they just don't have people. I saw a really funny thing on LinkedIn, but I think it was very serious. It was a sign on Dunkin' Donuts door and it said, please be patient. And if you can't be patient, fill out an application. I saw right? that. I like, that was funny. That's yeah. the depth of the environment we're in right now. It's not, yeah. hey, I need and I'm having a hard time finding one or two people. We're really struggling. So in yep. an environment where we're really struggling, how do you hold up to these behaviors and not just take random people off the street and actually yeah. maintain your culture? I, I, it's, it's a fair question. And, and I don't want to underestimate how hard that is. It's tough. And so, so a couple things I'd say. So first of all, I'm going to make the general statement that we will never build the kind of organization we want to have, assuming we want to have a great organization, we will never build the kind of organization we want to have bringing in people who are not a good fit. Not going to happen. I don't care how desperate we are. If we bring in people who are going to be a lousy fit, we will undermine everything we're doing. Yes, we may be able to fill a slot, but we'll fill, a slot, uh, fill the slot with a jerk with a lousy attitude who's going to do a poor job and is going to, can I say piss off on LinkedIn? Going to piss off all of our, all of our, uh, our potential customers, that's not going to do us much good. So we've got to be rigorous as hard as that is. It takes a lot of leadership discipline, you know, in the face of that real world challenge. It's nice to say in the theoretical world, oh, you should only hire really good people. But in the real world where we're faced with this challenge, like you said today, it takes a lot of leadership discipline to avoid the mistake of just filling a spot because it's empty. You know, sometimes I say it this way, sometimes it feels like we as employers are comparing this particular candidate who's in front of us to an empty chair. Compared to an empty chair, the guy looked darn good. But is he or she really what we needed? Well, maybe not. It takes, it's hard. It takes a lot of discipline to avoid that mistake. But we're not going to build the kind of company we're trying to if we do that. Now, I want to add a little bit of, of um, nuance to what I just said. And the nuance is that I have described cultural fit in somewhat black and white ways. And the world's not black and white. It's really gray. So it really isn't that some people are a good fit and others aren't a good fit. There's a range of degree of fit. So 
if I were to, <clears throat> if we were to create an arbitrary scale, let's say one to 10, and on one end of the spectrum, one is that person is a horrendous fit for what we're trying to hire in, from a cultural standpoint. And on the other end of the spectrum, a 10 is, oh my God, how did I ever get so lucky to find them? People are not usually one or 10. They're somewhere in between the two. Mm -hmm. And and so in to be realistic about it, in in times, in there are two situations in which we may compromise a little. One is when it's freaking desperate to hire anybody. Okay, in those kinds of circumstances, I might be willing to hire a six and a half, where in previous times I might not settle for anything less than a seven and a half. But if I hire a three, I'm going to screw up my company. So there might be a little more flex today than maybe, but there's still a limit to, we're not bringing in people that aren't going to be a good fit. The second time in which, or way in which we may have a little more flexibility in that nuance is there are some roles that are more difficult to hire than others. So I think about, give a good example. In my first company, I had a woman who was, um, she was a telemarketer. Her, her job all day long was to make cold calls to prospects and get turned down all day long as she tries to set po appointments for our sales team. That is a miserable job. You can't be a normal human being and do that all day. And so, okay, I could live with a little more there in that role than in a different role that, you know what, I could hire somebody like that or replace somebody like that. So, okay, I'm going to live with a little more. Now, that doesn't mean anything goes. That doesn't mean she could be a lousy fit. But, okay, on that one to 10 scale, maybe I go a little further down the line for a position that's really hard to find than in a position that's easy to find. But there's still a limit to that. If I bring in people that are going to be a lousy fit, I will undermine my company. And what I'll be left with is great. I got a lot of people, but I had a lousy company that doesn't perform very well. So it's hard but it takes a lot of discipline and it's a, it's a terrible mistake if we bring those people in. You know, it's interesting um, in, in talks that I do, we sometimes talk about getting rid of some of the lousy fits. And, and I do this thing where I'll ask CEOs typically or senior leaders, you know, how many of you have ever fired one of those people that was like a high performer, but a really lousy fit? And almost everybody in the room will raise their hand and say, yeah, I've done that. And then I ask them, so when you did that, what did everybody else say? And practically in unison, you know what they say. Thank God. We were wondering when you're just, oh God, I'm we so waited glad. waited way too long. It. We've all had this. And then I asked them, then I asked them this question. I asked the CEO, so what did you say to yourself after you got rid of them? And almost in unison, they say, I should have done this a long time ago. You know, what took me so long? We all know this. So why, if I know that, why am I going to bring somebody in who I'm going to be saying about that, that about later? Ugh. But we get tempted by that desperation. So it does, again, I don't want to minimize how hard that is, but it, take, it takes a lot of leadership discipline to avoid making that mistake. Yeah, it's, it's a hard call, especially I can only imagine yeah. an environment like this. Um, a little bit while ago, you mentioned customers. Um, and I've actually got a couple of questions about that coming over, yeah. about how culture ties into kind of the customer experience and extends out. Can you talk a little bit about how do you share these behaviors downstream um, so that your yeah. customers feel your culture? Yeah. So, so when we talk about, you know, everything I talk about is, as we've been reviewing is learning to be more systematic, more intentional, more purposeful about creating the kind of culture that we want. I organize the steps that it takes to do that around a framework that I wrote about in my books called the eight step framework, eight different things. If you do these eight things, this is how you systematically create a culture in an organization. And while all of the eight steps are important, at the end of the day, there's really two steps that drive probably 80 or 90% of the impact. Like if you do these two things, you're gonna be really successful. And if you don't do these two things, you just won't get very far. Those two things are first, what we've just been talking about. And that is, how do I define more clearly exactly what I want the culture to be? And that's defining those behaviors that I call fundamentals. The second step is really how you operationalize this. How do you get it downstream is to use your phrase to, to all the people. 
And we do that through a concept, very simple concept, but very powerful that I call creating rituals. So a ritual to me is a behavior that you do over and over and over again until it becomes baked in, it becomes second nature. So simple examples of rituals. We get up in the morning, we brush our teeth. You, hopefully. You, you, know, you go to a ball game, we do the national anthem. When I was a kid in school, we used to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Some people before a meal, they say a prayer. These are routines, they're just rituals. Mm -hmm. The reason that rituals are so critical to success is that most people and most organizations aren't very good at sticking with things. We come up with all kinds of wonderful ideas, whether it's personally, you know, the, the New Year's resolution for the diet or the exercise program, or whether it's the program at work that we're really excited about, and then life gets in the way and we get busy and it falls by the wayside. When something becomes a ritual, it's not hard to do. It's just part of the way we do things. So the way we use that simple concept is we take those behaviors, those fundamentals, as I call them, and it gets rolled out to people in, in interactive sessions. And then we begin to focus on one of these fundamentals every week through a series of rituals. And I'll give you an example in just a second. So week number one, everybody in the whole company all week long is thinking about and working on and focusing on practicing fundamental number one. The week after that, everybody's on number two and the week after that three and four and so on. And we just keep cycling through them over and over and over and over again. So an example of a ritual. In my company and, and every one of our clients, the first agenda item on every meeting that we have, whether it's a Zoom meeting or an in-person meeting, a leadership meeting, a customer, if we have a meeting going on in our company this week, every single one of those meetings, the first agenda item of that meeting is the fundamental of the week. And we spend the first three to five minutes talking about it. What does it mean? How do we practice it? What could we do better? Did it just come up with a customer yesterday? And we spent three to five minutes and then we move on. We don't want to take over the meeting, but just a few minutes. Just to clarify for a second. Yeah. You said you do this in customer meetings as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's very powerful when you do it with a customer meeting. I mean, customer starts to say, wow, if they're that serious about their culture, I'll bet they're pretty serious about how they're going to deliver the services that you know, I'm buying from them. Mm -hmm. It has a huge impact on customers. So think about in, in any of your companies that are on this call, imagine if, if think of all the, all the meetings that go on in your company in a given week in all different places and all different people. And imagine if in every single one of those meetings, people were talking about your fundamental of the week. Think about all the teaching that would go on, all the awareness that would be raised. And if you do that this week and next week, everybody's doing that on fundamental number two and the week after that three and four and five and six and so on. And we keep cycling through them over and over and over and over and over again. Sooner or later, these behaviors start to become internalized. They just become the way we do things around here. And that's really the essence of, of the concept that, you know, if and there are other rituals companies practice, but the idea is if we can define in really clear terms, the behaviors that you say as a leader drive success in your organization. And then we can create this, I call it a structured systematic way to teach those behaviors to people over and over and over and over and over again, those behaviors are gonna become internalized in people. And that's how you get people living to that culture. Now that eight step framework that I referred to includes things like what we were just talking about. How do you hire people who are gonna be a good fit? How do you integrate them into the company after you've hired them? How do you coach them? How do you create accountability? There's other things, but the core of it is this really, really simple idea that if we define in really clear terms, those behaviors that are gonna drive success, and then we create this systematic way to teach those behaviors, they're gonna to start to live in our people. And that works just as well remotely as it does in person. Now, how many fundamentals do people companies typically have? Oh, this always surprises people. So why I'm asking it. Yes, I know. I know. So I'm going to, I have to explain this to people. So, you know, th this is another of these places that I depart from conventional wisdom, but you'll understand when I explain it. So I I've done this process that I've been describing with more than 400 different companies and many others have read my books and done it on their own. But in the 400 that I have experience with, believe it or not, the least number of behaviors that I've seen in those 400 is 18. 
the most, and that's the only one I've ever seen less than 20. The most I've ever seen is 40. And the sweet spot seems to end up somewhere in the 25 to 30 area. I have 30 in my company. The, 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 the reason that most of this sounds kind of crazy to people, and I always say the number doesn't really matter. And I'll explain why in just a second. But the conventional wisdom for why most people will tell you, hey, you shouldn't have any more than like four to six things because you know that's not, you, people are never going to be able to remember more than that. And you're right, they're not. But here's the question I always ask people. What's our goal? Is our goal to have something that our people can recite? Or is our goal to have our people live the behaviors that drive success in our company? I think it's the latter. And there's more than four or five behaviors that drive success. I often say to people, if you looked at mine, I have a little card with mine on it, and we have 30, 30 fundamentals. I say to people, if you were to look at my 30 fundamentals and you say, I only want to have five, I would ask, which 25 of those do you not want to be teaching? You'd end up struggling. To, I, I'm not going to, you don't want to teach people to honor commitments. You don't want to teach them to practice blameless problem solving. I mean, there's so many things that you don't want to leave out. The reason ultimately that the number doesn't matter is that think about how we're using them. Whether you have four or 11 or 17 or 29, we're only taking them one at a time anyway. And we're going to keep cycling through them over and over and over and over again. So it doesn't really matter how many we have outside of something silly. If there were 362, we'd never get back to the beginning. But outside of something silly, it doesn't really matter. And we're not going up to any of our people saying, Aviva, can you recite number 11? No, I don't need anybody to recite anything. I just know if we take one at a time and we focus on it really intently, work at it, and then we cycle through them over and over and over and over again, they're going to become internalized in our people. That's why the number doesn't really matter. But 25 to 30 is what is most common. And I'll tell you just as a side comment that virtually every client I've ever worked with started the process saying, I don't want to have any more than like five. You don't understand. This isn't going to work for me. And none of them are saying that today. So I totally get people's concern about that conventional wisdom. And they're done that. My executive team was like, are you kidding me? Five, yes. right? Five. Um, yeah. We ended up having 20 fundamentals of the pace setter way. Okay. So, yeah. um, but it does, you are right. It just becomes innate in your everyday. The language just becomes a common terminology, almost like a mm. definition book and guide. Um, and I think people, it's hard to imagine that because you think, oh, you have to memorize it to get there, but living mm. it, you know, yes. just becomes ingrained. So it does. Um, yeah. I can speak to that from experience, but I remember that battle, which is why I asked the question. <laughs> yes, it's a fair question. <laughs> um, so we've talked about, um, you know, you mentioned, so this works just as well in remote. Um, I'm curious, can you go into that a little more? Um, sure. A lot of people are in a remote hybrid workforce right now. How do you ritualize and create that environment? Um, yeah. So first thing I'd say, Viva, is that... There was a dynamic that happens in companies before the pandemic. And then I'll tie that back to how the pandemic has, has applies to this. So if you picture this, those of you that are working in companies, when a company is smaller and it's got, it's just starting and maybe it's got five or 10 or 15 or 20 people to a degree as leaders, we don't have to be, it would be better if we were, but we don't have to be as systematic about our culture because we were all together and everybody was, a, if I'm the leader, everybody was around me every day and they saw me and they watched my example. And even by osmosis, they just kind of picked up the vibe, the way that we do things around here. And that was kind of good enough to get the job done. But as a company grows and it goes from 15 or 20 people to maybe 50 people or a hundred or 200, or maybe it has multiple locations or maybe it makes an acquisition or two, all of a sudden, they're not all seeing me as the leader anymore. I, my, my, my reach isn't far enough to touch all of those people. And so if I don't have some more systematic way to draw, create and drive my culture, I'm at significant risk of losing it all as we start to expand. Mm -hmm. Well, the pandemic kind of forced that dynamic on everybody because whether you were small, medium or large, all of a sudden your people weren't around anymore. They're all working from home. And so if you were relying primarily on physical proximity 
as the primary way in which you are driving culture, good luck, because that's not going to work anymore. So we have to have, the, the, the pandemic forced us to be more, those that are successful at least, forced people to need to be more systematic, to have a more, a greater method for driving their culture instead of just hoping people are going to pick it up by osmosis. And so the, the, the system that, that I teach and talk about is actually just as effective whether you're working remotely or not. My company, my current company, which is my second company, has been remote from the beginning. So forget the pandemic. We've always been remote. My people mm -hmm. are all over the place. And we practice our culture in the same ways that everybody else does. So we have our fundamental of the week. We practice it every week. Every week, the message goes out around it. Every meeting we have on Zoom, we start with our fundamental of the week. We have a mobile app that I use and many of our clients use. And on my mobile app, a weekly message goes out at the beginning of the week about this week's fundamental and a lesson about it. And people comment on it or like it. So I've got my people engaging with each other over the app, talking about the fundamental of the week. On the app, every day I get a push notification with a quick tip which is a reminder of some insight related to this week's fundamental. So every single day, I and all of my team on our phone are getting a reminder, oh, that's a good thought. Yeah, that, that reminds me of something about our fundamental. So I'm, I'm constantly engaged with it. On so our being... phone, there's videos and teaching points and all kinds of ways. So all of the things that people do when they're together, we can do that stuff all remotely. Awesome. So being systematic in and of itself, basically. Yes. Um, yes. We are very tight on time at this point, and I am respectful yeah. of everybody's time here. Um, I do want to ask you one last question before I close out, and it's something I ask everybody on the show. Um, what is something you would like to try in business or in life that's outside your comfort zone that you haven't yet? Mm, that's an interesting question. Well, I'll tell you right up what it's not, then I'll tell you what it is. So what it's not is it sure as heck isn't like jumping out of a freaking airplane. I have no need to do that. I oh, know but that's people, so that's much like, fun. Oh, um, leave me. I have no need to do that in my life. If, when I die, if I haven't jumped out of an airplane, that'll be perfectly okay. <laughs> so there's no need for that in my life. Um, you know what I'd like to learn? I'd like to learn how to sing. Okay. Like I'm a really lousy singer. And, and music brings so much joy to people. And I'm, so, I'm almost, I'm embarrassed about how bad I am. And I'd like to learn to be better if it's possible. Um, but it's ve way outside my comfort zone. That's awesome. I love it. That is a very yeah. unique answer for once I've gotten. Well, everybody, there you have it. Um, one, you got to help him learn to sing. Um, two, <laughs> you got just a smidge of all great things that David has to share about culture, about talent, a remote workforce. Um, if you are interested in talking to him more or myself or also Jennifer, I'm going to put everybody's info back in chat. Um, the recording of this will also be sent out to everybody. Um, so you'll get a replay of this and be able to watch it over. Um, and I just want to thank you, David, for joining me today. It is such an honor to have you as a guest on my show. Always my and pleasure, Ava. Thank you to everyone who's here attending and all the questions you asked. And until next time on Beyond the Comfort Zone, I want to encourage everybody here, not just David, um, but to try something new outside of your comfort zone because it's where growth occurs and honestly, life begins. So thank you, everybody. I really appreciate you being here. Thanks, Aviva. Awesome conversation. <laughs> thank My you, Aviva. Thank you, David. You're yeah, very welcome. Great. That was great. Thank you.